everyone. My name is Borisov Gerasimov, and I'm Communications and Advocacy Coordinator at the Global Alliance Against Trafficking Women. This year, together with Sharmila Parmanant, uh, recent, who recently completed her PhD studies in uh, PhD in Gender Studies at the University of Cambridge, uh, we are holding a series of conversations to uh, evaluate uh, the. UN Protocol Against Trafficking or the Palermo Protocol uh, 20 years after its adoption. So today we are joined by Ishita Data from the International Women's Rights Action Watch Asia Pacific. Hi Ishita and thank you for uh, agreeing to speak with us. Hi Ishita, thanks for joining us. Um, we can start with you telling us a bit about yourself um, and Iro and your work in the area of human trafficking. Thank you so much for having me. It's really great uh, to be part of this um, series and it's a really important moment for reflection for many of us in the human rights and women's rights uh, community. So thanks again for having me. Uh, so by way of introduction, my name is Ishita Datta and I work as a program manager for uh, ERA Asia Pacific, which is a global South feminist international women's rights organization. Um, and we have been working for over 25 years now to make the promise of uh, international women's human rights, particularly the CEDAW convention, a reality for women at the local level. Um, and uh, specifically uh, our uh, work centers around using the CEDAW review space and the CEDAW framework and uh, using it to um, push forward a political vision of women's rights that is inclusive and intersectional. Thank you, Ishita. So you, that's also how I know Iro as an expert on CEDO. So if you, if you compare states' obligations to address trafficking under CEDO and under the trafficking protocol, would you say that one is better um, than the other, and if so, how, or uh, to put it differently, what are the pros and cons of each from your experience? Sure, so I can try to answer this question, but I'm not sure that I will have a very good answer for you. Um, so just, I think, perhaps giving a little bit more background about how ERA does its work will help me answer this question. So um, what uh, ERA was, ERA Asia Pacific was set up 25 years ago um, to be and to be a vehicle for global South women's voices to be part of uh, international standard setting on women's rights because our founders thought that at that time uh, those international policy spaces were not responsive to uh, voices from the uh, voices of women from the global South essentially. And uh, in the intervening years since, uh, our mandate has now become more uh, focused on uh, marginalized groups or groups facing multiple or intersectional forms of discrimination, because now we recognize that actually many women from the Global South do ac access international spaces, but it's often underrepresented issues and marginalized voices that don't get access. Um, and so in uh, this, sort of backstory is to illustrate that uh, our engagement with the CEDAW committee on uh, Article 6, uh, trafficking and exploitation of prostitution has happened from the standpoint of trying to understand the issue of trafficking as it affects sex workers and trying to uh, support sex workers' rights advocacy on the issue of trafficking, because at CEDAW, because of the formulation of Article 6 as well, those two issues get addressed uh, together quite frequently. So in uh, an organizational sense, um, I think the only time we have sort of evaluated the value of the trafficking in persons uh, convention and you know the relevance of it for the work that we do uh, was in 2016 when we together with the global network of sex work projects uh, developed a document called framing uh, sorry the framework on rights of sex workers 
under CEDAW. And that was basically an exercise uh, to understand how would you actually utilize all the CEDAW articles and the whole CEDAW convention to advance sex workers' rights. And in that, we assessed that uh, the, what the adoption of the trafficking uh, convention has taught us that um, that was a round that was sort of won by the abolitionists because despite uh, strong advocacy from post-colonial feminists and global South feminists and sex workers themselves, on uh, the realities of trafficking as it takes place in global South contexts and the complexities around that, uh, those were not reflected at all in the trafficking convention. And so in 2016, when we were doing this evaluation, we thought if the CEDAW committee can actually make this distinction very clearly in terms of not conflating trafficking with sex work, then it can actually be a very helpful framework uh, in addressing trafficking, because then it would sort of overcome uh, that particular gap that we perceive in the trafficking convention, tip convention. So my next question is very related to that, actually, and you've actually started answering it already, which is historically, what impact do you think then the protocol has had on women's rights? And I mean, I guess, what what are the pitfalls of this approach of conflating potentially um, all sex work with trafficking? Um, how have states tended to receive, maybe even co-opt this particular approach into their programming? So what kind of policies then were enacted on the, on the basis of this assumption or on the basis of this conflation? And what kind of policies instead would you prefer to see then? Sure, so just for clarity, uh, the question is, how are we seeing policies evolve as a result of the conflation of trafficking? And yeah. And yes. what kind of policies would be helpful instead? What would your alternative world look like? Yeah. Okay, great, sure. Based on our, so, observation of, um, so, okay, let me, again, a bit of backstory or context to EROS, right? So uh, EROS Asia Pacific organizes a program called From Global to Local three times a year in Geneva prior to each CEDA review session, where we train women's rights activists from eight countries that are being reviewed at each session on strategic tactical advocacy. So how to go about engaging uh, in advocacy with the CEDAW committee when you're in Geneva, right? And there's, it's part of the demystification and, uh, you know, transparency and accountability uh, project or process that we at ERA see ourselves playing in terms of making sure that these international spaces are accessible to everybody. Um, and so at, when, we, when we undertake that program, we actually get a very close glimpse at uh, the legal and policy frameworks on women's rights in the countries that are being reviewed by the CEDAW committee. Um, and so from our analysis or our observation, let's say not analysis, of uh, the sort of laws that are being enacted around trafficking um, and prostitution in many countries is that we noticed that in Western European countries, for example, uh, there is um, more that there, there is in more countries than not, uh, there have been uh, end demand laws that have been enacted. Uh, so, for example, in Ireland, Ireland was last reviewed in 2017, and uh, that was February 2017. And that that CEDAW review came at the heels of uh, the passing of the end demand law in Ireland. Um, and the mainstream women's rights groups uh, that were present there uh, who had campaigned for this law uh, were very happy and saw this as a progressive uh, step by their states. And, uh, you know, they expressed this in the way that they did their advocacy with the CEDAW committee. Um, and there was one representative from Sex Workers Alliance Ireland um, who actually also presented about uh, the 
negative impact that this law was happy, having on sex workers in Ireland who were being forced to you know, work under very unsafe conditions um, or uh, you know, face other types of human rights violations like police violence and uh, violence from third parties, et cetera, the profiling of migrants as a result of this law. So these were all issues that were raised by uh, SWAI. But unfortunately, in the CEDAW concluding observations, uh, the CEDAW committee only made a recommendation to Ireland to review the impact that this law was having on sex workers, but they did not fully engage with the range of violations that the sex workers' rights activists had presented to the committee. And so this incident we have seen repeated also for Norway and for Sweden, uh, which also have the end demand model. So uh, for me, it's not a question of what policy would I like, uh, but my question, my uh, response is if somebody else with a lived reality is presenting an alternative, uh, you know, reality, <laughs> and they are uh, stating in very clear terms uh, the impact of a law that conflates trafficking and sex work. In practice, maybe not in uh, you know in legal provisions in legal terms, then who who will I pay attention to? The person who has the lived reality, or persons who think that they have won an ideological feminist battle? So you engage with the CEDAW framework, which inevitably is about state obligations, right? Like it's something yeah. feminists inevitably find ourselves in. We need to. De- to dance with the state, right. but the state sometimes is part of the problem, right? So historically, when it comes to women, the programmed responses of the state usually involves restricting freedom rather than increasing it. And a lot of these things are happening in the name of protection, right? Um, so basically all of these feminist demands for care that we articulate are very easily refracted by the state to impose restrictions instead. So what best practices, I guess, or what like practices of feminism does Eero espouse? And you've discussed some of them, but I think it would be good to just highlight them for organizations that are doing feminist work. What practices avoid this trap? What practices then actually involve meaningful representation, I suppose? That's a great question. And I think it's something that we are grappling with. I think not just us, in the feminist movement along about the limits of the carceral state and how we can how our visions of justice can be realized through this state through a model that is set up to oppress um, and so i really do not have a very good answer for you uh, but i think for us what has been a learning let's say in our interactions uh, with uh, migrant rights groups that we have come in contact with through GATW, uh, through sex workers' rights groups that we have come in contact with through the Global Network of Sex Work Projects and the Asia Pacific Network of Sex Workers, and our allies in the you know broader women's rights and human rights movements, is that in the context of trafficking, uh, we are constantly saying that a criminal justice system response by itself is never going to get you the result that you want because the criminal justice system is set up in a way that it will uh, it, re- it will reproduce the power imbalances that are taking place in the larger world. And the problem that you are trying to solve in the context of trafficking is not is to go beyond holding the individual quote unquote perpetrator accountable to holding the larger systems um, or you know, structural uh, pinpointing what those structural causes are and who is actually uh, profiting at a grand scale. And that can happen through the criminal justice system. But I think unfortunately what happens in discussions around topics such as trafficking is that uh, there is no Um, I think there is less willingness to engage with the structural because it's really hard because it's, if you say the response to uh, 
you know, I think Bobby said in an interview that we did with him a few months back, or even a year ago now, on, uh, you know, what does it take to end trafficking? And he basically said, if states followed all their ab obligations that are laid out in the Sustainable Development Goals, in the CEDAW, in the TIP Convention, then there would be no trafficking. Because what you're trying to say there is that if there was actually substantive equality, if people had equal access to uh, all their rights, particularly uh, in the economic sense, if people had equal economic rights, then you would, uh, you would not have trafficking. But it's much harder to have a conversation about dismantling capitalism. And it's much easier to say, uh, you know, a sensational version of trafficking where you arrest uh, the, you know, bad guy who like creeps up and is uh, abducting uh, women and like selling them into prostitution. And that sort of imagery evokes a certain response, which, I mean, if that is happening, that should be addressed. But it, I think uh, we... Yeah, we are not, it's, it's just, um, yeah, I, I don't know. It's like, it's, it's such a tough question. I want to pick up on something uh, you said earlier and then on something else you said earlier. So when you, when you were speaking about Ireland, you know, and why the committee didn't want to hear the people with lived experience versus the people who feel they've won an ideological battle. Okay, so on the specific question of why is the committee responding to uh, certain, um, certain types of advocacy and not others, I think um, for me uh, personally, engaging in this advocacy on trafficking and working, uh, watching, um, the CEDAW committee work, uh, I think I sort of explain it in a way that the CEDAW review space is in many ways a reflection of the women's rights movement, right? So the same debates and uh, the um, discussions, dialogues, etc., that we are having within the women's rights movement are sort of getting reflected up in uh, many ways before the CEDAW committee. In terms of being an advocacy space, uh, we can just think about who in our local and national context has play when it comes to trafficking, right? It's, it's the quote unquote mainstream women's rights organizations who are advocating for these trafficking policies. Uh, sex workers are going unheard. And so that sort of power dynamic that gives rise to that type of situation where a sex worker's voice is always devalued compared to a mainstream women's rights activist is the same power imbalance that is being reproduced even at a global level. Um, and yeah, I think we have to be, uh, we can't do advocacy being divorced from this reality because uh, that is, I think, something that we do forget at times. And we think that the playing field is level and everybody that wants to get a UN, you know, ECOSOC accreditation and then go and talk to the Human Rights Committee can just do that. But um, yeah, I don't know if that answers your question. But I think like another, another point to flag for people uh, might be that the UN itself is like an extreme, I mean, we all have, uh, we, I mean, I think we've all been experiencing fatigue with the UN and its systems and its processes for a long time. And I think for us, one of the reasons we believe that as era specific as a feminist organization, we need to continue uh, holding the line in terms of ensuring accountability for women's rights through a critical international process such as the CEDAW review is because this space is really precious and it's constantly under attack. So states are trying to roll back 
uh, civic space, not only at the domestic level, but also at the international level. And then you have uh, women's rights organizations that have always been vocal and loud, including on issues like trafficking, who have had access to these spaces for a really long time. And so part of our commitment to being in this space and sort of uh, despite all the challenges, uh, continue, continuing uh, to engage with the committee uh, is to make sure that we can play a facilitative role and ensure that people who have been on the peripheries all this while, uh, also because we have not paid attention to these types of issues in the past, that they actually have access to the space and can meaningfully participate. You mentioned earlier that um, you know you were hoping that engagement with CEDO uh, will bring about positive change in the area of trafficking. And until now, uh, there were just Article 6 in CEDO, uh, but there was no specific uh, elaboration. Now, uh, for the past two years, um, and, and now, when I say now, we are speaking one week after the committee published its general recommendation on trafficking, uh, which they've been developing for two years, and you and GW were involved in this very much. So now that this is out after such a long and intensive process, what are your thoughts on the general recommendation? Sure. Um, so having been involved in this process uh, for the um, last two years, I think we saw the GR go through various stages of development. And um, I think for, I'm not speaking for GATW, although they did, uh, they went on this whole journey together with us. But I think for ERA, uh, part of the investment on of uh, ensuring that uh, we engage quite heavily with this general recommendation development process was uh, because of uh, what I laid out before, which is that uh, one was that we wanted the CEDA committee to uh, give a progressive interpretation to the trafficking standard that is within CEDA, um, but we also wanted to use uh, the influence and the access that we have to make sure that uh, the advocacy demands of uh, folks in, my, uh, in precarious work, including sex work, domestic work, um, and migrant workers in general, uh, that those voices and speci specifically the lived realities of women from the global south um, are reflected in this international legal instrument. Having reviewed the draft, gen, uh, no, the general recommendation is no longer a draft. Um, I think uh, I'll start with the positive sides first, uh, which is that it has uh, it sets up uh, the context for trafficking as being located in the global macroeconomic uh, context, right? So, which is a promising start. And then it takes this analysis forward to uh, make towards a strong comprehensive protection framework based on labor rights and migrant rights for all women workers, including in the informal sector and irrespective of their migration status. Um, it also includes guarantees of non-criminalization of migrants, which is undoubtedly a very progressive stance. And for all these reasons, uh, the general recommendation actually contains standards that would be very useful to uh, informal workers and migrant workers. Uh, that said, uh, if the GR had just stopped there, I think we would have said that, uh, you know, we have the most progressive international legal instrument on trafficking and women's rights in our hands now. Unfortunately, the committee has uh, addressed uh, exploitation of prostitution, which it is mandated to do by Article 6 uh, in the general recommendation. But extremely confusingly, they have used the term sexual exploitation in many places, 
and use these terms interchangeably. So uh, CIRA doesn't define sexual exploitation anywhere. And if you refer to the uh, drafting uh, discussions uh, that took place when CEDAW was being drafted in, nine, in the 1970s, the discussion around Article 6 and specifically around exploitation of prostitution was that states particularly chose the language of exploitation of prostitution as opposed to just including prostitution, as many of us know. However, um, and uh, the language of it has always been trafficking and exploitation of prostitution. However, confusingly uh, and um, without sort of building on how the CEDAW committee themselves have addressed trafficking and exploitation of prostitution in their own concluding observations and in their own practice. Uh, in this general recommendation, the CEDAW committee has linked sexual exploitation and exploitation of prostitution as leading to trafficking, which uh, I understood from Bobby is the formulation in the TIP protocol, uh, in the TIP convention. Um, and for me, that is a step backwards because here we were trying to use this opportunity to de-link trafficking and exploitation of prostitution and then use the CEDAW GR in a way that it would actually address trafficking as it takes place in the sex industry. But what the GR has finally done has it has created more confusion and muddied the ground or no, muddied the water. Huh? You cannot muddy the ground, sorry. Uh, it has made, it has added more uh, sort of confusion on this topic, let's say, um, because CEDA still doesn't define sexual exploitation. Uh, and uh, they, it also doesn't define, in a sense, exploitation of prostitution. Um, and, uh, and then it also makes... Um, references to discouraging demand and uh, prosecuting and investigating persons on the demand side, uh, which from experience we know. And this was a point that was raised again and again by the sex workers rights movement to the CEDAW committee that uh, the uh, legal and policy measures to criminalize those on the demand side actually end up having extremely adverse impacts on the human rights of sex workers. Um, and this exhortation was completely uh, dismissed. And now we have uh, this situation. So there is still more work to be done, I guess. Our last question is, um, so given everything we've talked about and perhaps more stuff that we haven't, uh, what changes would you want to see in the anti-trafficking field, including the interpret you know, the interpretation implementation of the TIP protocol uh, in the coming years. And here we're talking about like the entire space, right? Donors, nonprofit orgs that are engaging with it, governments, or even experts and academics and how we are having these conversations in the first place. Um, keeping in mind the pandemic, but also, you know, beyond the pandemic. So forward looking strategies, I think, um... The, I think for me, the hope, um, despite um, a not uh, positive outcome at the end of the GR advocacy process was that uh, as we did our advocacy over the last two years, um, there were representatives from uh, the migrants' rights, labor rights, uh, women's rights and sex workers' rights movements who came together consistently and around very specific, clear, and cohesive advocacy points, right? So people showed up for sex workers' rights in a way that, uh, in my experience with ERA, we hadn't had this had happened before. Um, and I think I really appreciate the work GADW is doing uh, in convening the intermovement dialogues that they have been, I think, over the last year and a half or so, which is again trying to bring together groups that are supposedly addressing the same issue but from different perspectives, um, but trying to sort of facilitate a conversation that shows that there is value in actually understanding what the others are demanding for and seeing how 
that work can happen together. Because I think, unfortunately, uh, the advocacy on trafficking and the legal and policy standards that we're getting as a result of this advocacy are a prime example of what happens when uh, there is no solidarity or that uh, you know, advocacy demands are fractured and people are working for near-term gains. And so you know, the passage of a law is seen to be a victory, whereas uh, you know, that, that cannot be the end of the struggle. And the law actually ends up victimizing uh, those that it's supposed to protect. So for me, I think uh, if we are able to translate the process lessons that we've learned uh, in the last few years of engaging on advocacy in, uh, around this general recommendation, uh, that would be a huge win. Um, and I think for donors, I have a related recommendation, right? Because the folks who are funding us or the pots of money that are coming to fund quote unquote feminist organizations or folks who are support, who are sex work allies are also being, are also funding abolitionist organizations or folks who are, you know, doing counterproductive things it, or what we perceive to be counterproductive in the context of trafficking. So for, uh, for me, that means that a conversation needs to be had about what happens when you find groups that are in effect canceling each other's <laughs> work out and how, how is that, how is that uh, helpful in any way, let alone you know, advancing the ends of justice. And what can those of us with a uh, bit more leverage with donors um, or you know, access to donors, uh, can we have those conversations with them? And can we make sure that uh, they actual, actually fund communities? Like why only have one red umbrella fund in the world? There should be, sex workers should receive funding from uh, all the donors all the time, everywhere. And you know, domestic workers should receive all the funding in the world. There should not be like just one forge initiative to support migrant workers in the context of COVID-19. I, I was talking to another colleague from GADW a few weeks back, um, but she said to me that for migrants' rights, the post-COVID or the COVID-19 epidemic was the test, right? And the world completely failed migrants. So like talking about the international legal frameworks that have been set up to protect migrants' rights, to the institutional and policy mechanisms uh, at the at all levels, right? Like nobody was actually able to act in a way that could ensure comprehensive protection of rights of migrant workers. And so, for me, that is such a that was such a sobering thought because I actually hadn't thought about it in such uh, in in this really uh, sharp way. And that made me think that instead of all this energy being expended on you know, arguing about whether sexual exploitation actually fits under the definition of trafficking under CEDAW or not, and you know, what would have been a better use of resources to make sure that migrant workers were better protected when like, this sort of calamity occurred?